Meditative Paradigms of Seder. In search for a new spiritual link with the past, there are those among the present-day movement for renewal in Germany who wish to go back to the Edda and the cycle of Germanic ideas related to it. It is thanks to them that alongside that which is purely fabulous, the inner richness of our sagas and folktales has again become visible from under the rubble and ashes left by the fires of the stake. Alfred Rosenberg Forward. In order to understand the literal text of the meditative paradigms of Seder, it is important to know the basic history of Christianity, both religious and secular. It is all too prevalent of the pious practitioners of Christianity to paint a pretty picture of this period of our history, leaving out the horrific and treasonous crimes attributed to this plague called Christianity. As always, the victors write history, and, as a pagan, I am dedicated to the pursuit of exposing this plague and promoting our true folkish history and ideals. Precisely what Christianity did to the old world of Rome was that superior individuals, superior in physical beauty and sound instinct, in intellect, wisdom, self-reliance and courage, were made to despise and be ashamed of their superiority, and thus to deny and neglect and repudiate and lose their superiority. William Gailey Simpson The Beginning Christianity had its unfortunate beginning during the later part of the Roman Empire. Prior to it, the Nordic Romans worshipped and honored a variety of gods, goddesses, and deities incorporated from ancient Greece. Christianity as a religion can be traced to around 100 BCE, where a poor Jewish tribal sect called the Essenes lived in catacombs just outside Jerusalem along the Dead Sea. Here they practiced a self-debased form of religion which would later become Christianity. A well-known Jew named Saul of Tarsus began to persecute these early degenerate Christians, but for some reason or other had a change of heart. The reason for such is pure speculation. However, possibly he saw in this religion of love and turn the other cheek a means that could be used for his benefit in his war against the Nordic Romans, of which he hated, and with good reason, as the Nordic Romans under Julius Caesar utterly crushed Jerusalem and killed many Jews in the process. Next thing we know, Toward the end of the first century, we see this Jew Saul in Rome preaching this religion as Christianity to all the low-life bums of the inner city. Saul, of course, would later become the biblical savior, Saint Paul, aka Paul the Apostle. Like a plague, Christianity spread quickly throughout Rome, and with it bringing degeneration and erosion of the Nordic Roman spirit. The low-life bums and other genetic garbage were now lifted up at the expense of the far superior Nordics and with Christianity's pity ethic, equality was established. With Christianity and its teachings firmly established, the once proud Nordic Romans were induced into interbreeding with their slaves. As a result, the genetic makeup was lowered. The military power sharply declined, i.e. with the teachings of love, peace, equality, and turn the other cheek hardly being conducive to a strong military and their inherent moral code and value system was subjugated and lowered. The first Roman emperor to convert to Christianity was Constantine, and around 300 CE, he directed a hierarchy of religious clergymen to pen the Christian Bible. The Bible itself was based on the many stories and myths in circulation at the time. Both religious and secular history was also included, most stolen from other cultures and traditions with, of course, Christian perversion and name changes. The Dark Ages. Christianity demands the crucifixion of the intellect. Soren Kierkegaard. If Christ was in fact God, he knew the persecution that would be carried out in his name. He knew the millions that would suffer death through torture. And yet he died without saying one word to prevent what he must have known if he were God would happen. Robert G. Ingersoll. What followed is written down in history as the Dark Ages. Dark Ages, Medieval Period, and Middle Ages are all synonymous terms used to describe the period of decline which characterized Western civilization between 500 and 1400 CE. 
the power-hungry Christianized Romans warred with their pagan neighbors, the Germanics. The Germans previously enjoyed relative freedom and communion with nature. Political and religious power were not centralized. There were, of course, tribal leaders who had basic political power, and there were also various priests and priestesses representative of the Germanic gods and goddesses. The people would turn to them for ceremonial purposes and often in times of severe duress and before going to war. The Romans, not being able to conquer the Germans with physical force, began a ruthless campaign of forcefully Christianizing them. In the late 700s CE, under the Christian zealot Charlemagne, they began their attacks on pagan communities. These early attacks would later evolve into what is commonly referred to today as the Crusades, 1095 to 1291 CE, but were actually nothing but invasions on both Germanic and Celtic communities and tribes in the most brutal Christian bloodthirsty fashion. Once the Germanic and Celtic lands were under the control of Charlemagne, after years and years of bloodshed, the Christians used bribery, trickery, deceit, and all-out torture to coerce the people to denounce their pagan gods and goddesses. In some cases, the pagan tribal leaders were bribed with the prospect of power and riches to accept Christianity. Many gave in, and in turn forced this alien religion on their own kinsfolk. Those who rejected were thus heavily taxed and eventually had their land and belongings confiscated, early Big Brother, and in some cases were simply killed. Once Christianity was firmly rooted in the European nations, they enacted special laws barring the pagan faiths and practices. In 1231 CE, Gregory IX appointed inquisitors with far-reaching powers to individual church provinces. These inquisitors were both accusers and judges in one, and carried out the 1224 church legislation that all heretics were to be put to death. Anyone who was accused or actually caught breaking the law was maimed, tortured, and killed. This era is more commonly known as the Inquisitions, 1229 to 1833 CE. This was, of course, done in the name of the good lord of Christian scribes. Attack on Women and Goddess Worship There is nothing purer than the light of the sun or the breath of a maiden. Book of Manu, 250 BCE In the hand and in the nature of woman lies the preservation of our race. Alfred Rosenberg, 1893-1946 Wotanism lifted woman to the level of goddesses and lifted the procreative act to a sacrament, while later cultural periods, which in a self-satisfied manner fancied themselves to be exalted over the previous ones, set about to take away the divine status from woman, to degrade them to prostitutes, and to profane the creative act of generation as a simple vice. Guido von List, 1848-1919 Christianity especially singled out Aryan women during the Inquisitions. I have no compassion for witches. I would burn them all, spoke Martin Luther, 1483 to 1546, a leader in the so-called Christian Reformation. The witches, the word witch is derived from the Old English word wicke, which means wise one. Some women of both Odinism and Druidism were called witches, and were highly respected as they healed the sick of the tribe with herbs, plants, and other natural remedies. This was, of course, their craft, hence the term witchcraft. The witchcraft of the pagan religions were hunted. They too were tortured and killed. The witch hysteria was mainly fueled by the ignorance of the earth-hating Christians' inability to comprehend and understand the witchcraft practiced. They considered it to be sorcery and magic Thus, the work of the devil. All the mishaps and natural disasters, i.e. storms, droughts, failed crops, etc., of society were blamed on the witches. Christianity claimed literally thousands and thousands of lives. More than 100,000 suspected witches were killed in Germany, over 30,000 in France. Children should be forced to testify against their parents in witch trials. In fact, I recommend torturing children and invalids and to put the fear of God into them, I advocate burning them with hot irons so that the putrefied flesh will have to be cut out. 
As for witches, the punishment one can order against them by roasting and cooking them over a slow fire is not true justice, and not as bad as the torment which Satan has made for them in this world. To say nothing of the eternal agonies which are prepared for them in hell. So spoke Jean Baudin, a French public prosecutor and the author of the anti-witch document Démonomanie da Sorcier, 1580. It has been recorded that close to nine million executions of pagans, most being women, took place between the years 1484 and 1782 during the witch hysteria. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, says Exodus 22:18, And in Deuteronomy 18, 10, 12, there shalt not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through fire, or that useth divination or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. Wording in all biblical quotes may vary, depending on the translation that you have. There are some 300,000 variations in the New Testament alone. There are over 5,000 in Greek manuscripts, and the King James has been translated over 500 times. And so the legacy of the death cult under these types of pious biblical scribes justified their slaughter of women. There were some gallant and courageous sisters during the Dark Ages who, despite the threat of persecution, kept our pagan faith alive and organized witchery into a formal cult opposed to the Roman Catholic Church. They would often meet secretly at night dressed in stark black, hence the origins and tradition of wearing black, to mock an approaching Christian holiday. They especially enjoyed the mocking of All Saints Day, November 1st, where they would meet the day prior. This day, October 31st, became well known locally as the Night of the Witch, and later as All Hallows' Eve, and today is celebrated as Halloween. If one reads the story of Adam and Eve as told in the biblical scriptures, it should be clear to even the most casual observer that this story is a blatant attack on women and goddess worship. It is an attempt to additionally undermine the polytheistic, life-loving nature religions of our ancestors to be replaced by a monotheistic, life-hating religion devoid of female elements. In the many pre-Christian religions such as Zoroastrianism, Druidism, or Odinism, the god pantheon was made up of both male and female. The female goddesses were depicted with snakes. The snake itself is symbolic of the fertility goddess, the withdrawal and hibernation of the snake in winter is analogous to death, while shedding of its old skin of course represents immortality and its subsequent return in the spring represents rebirth, renewal. For example, the Greek goddess Demeter, who is always shown holding snakes along with wheat or grains, and Venus, who is shown nude with flowers or fruits, and Iduna, the Norse goddess, who produces the life-rejuvenating apples, is always shown nude under an apple tree surrounded by cats. Iduna and her apples are symbolic. Her nude breast symbolized nourishment, and her apples are symbolic of a woman's nature. She denotes the immortality of the race and eternal youth. Our pagan ancestors clearly understood the need for both male and female gods in order to make a complete circle in life. They fashioned their religions based on polytheistic natural themes, gods of the sky, the earth, of fertility, and of the unknown, as well those attributed to ancestors, the heroes of the folk, and the race. In the story of Adam and Eve, we have all the traditional goddess symbology, the nude woman, the magical special tree, and the snake, all in the center of a lush garden. In the ancient Mesopotamian stories, the man is simply kicked out of the garden. However, with the new Christianized version, we have a perversion of the original story. The woman, Eve, is demeaned and made out to be evil. She gives in to temptation and is seduced by the evil serpent. Then she turns around and bribes Adam, the man, into taking part of this so-called sin. Afterwards, when the head honcho, Yahweh, finds out and thus asks Adam what went down, Adam blames it all on Eve, instead of standing up and defending her like any honorable man would do. This is also attack on true manhood, as stated in prior, it's a self-debased religion. What happened as a result of this perversion? All the people of the earth must now pay the price for this original sin. It's all Eve's fault. Yet another anti-woman text in the Bible out of the hundreds 
is when a woman has her monthly menstrual period. She is considered, according to the Bible, unclean and must be isolated from all others. And if by chance someone happens to touch her during this period, he or she too is considered unclean. Leviticus 15, 19, 24. And when a woman gives birth to a child, she is also condemned and is considered unclean. Leviticus 12, 2, 6. If she bears a male child, she must be isolated like some sort of diseased animal for a total of 40 days and 80 days for a female child. The Bible demeans and degrades women into being mere objects of pure evil and sin, and that they should be ashamed of themselves and their bodily functions rather than accepting them as being purely a natural thing. And we must not leave out Numbers 5, 11, 31, where women are to be put through a sadistic and humiliating bizarre practice of bitter testing to see if they have committed adultery, and if they happen to fail this odd test where they are forced to drink a foreign substance, her belly is to swell and her thigh rot. Some translations say genital organs to shrink. And how about Deuteronomy 25, 12? Thou shalt cut off the hand of any woman who grabs the private parts of a man. Perverted and all out weird? Yes. Albeit, if one has ever read the Jewish Talmud, you will see the same type of perverted practices and laws. It doesn't surprise one much when it is accepted that they have the same Jewish origins. Bible Authors Plagiarist As the worst counterfeits in existence, invented to debase nature and all natural values, the priest himself is seen as he actually is, as the most dangerous form of parasite, as the venomous spider of creation. Frederick Nietzsche, 1844-1900 The various stories that make up the Christian Bible, both Old and New Testaments, were ripped off from other cultures and religions. I will give a few examples, albeit by no means an entire analysis. For starters, the story of Noah and the Flood was obviously taken from earlier myths in particular, those of Mesopotamian origin. The Mesopotamian empires arose around 8000 BCE. The Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh, which recounts the story of a flood, a surviving family, and a ship which rested on the edge of a mountaintop, has detailed parallels with that of the Noah story. The tablets recounting this epic and other Mesopotamian stories were discovered between 1849 and 1854 while British archaeologists were excavating a site at Nineveh, a buried city. In all, 25,000 clay tablets were unearthed at this site, dating to the 7th century BCE. And to go back even further, we can trace the Gilgamesh epic to the ancient Sumerian epic of the Deluge, which dates to 2000 BCE. The story of the creation as told in Genesis can be easily traced to not one, but two Mesopotamian stories. The Assyrian Enuma Elish, for example, was a story where the supreme deity Ashur, Ashur is called Marduk in the Babylonian version, of Assyria, fought and killed the mother goddess Tiamat, and then mutilated her body in six ritualistic steps, using the pieces to create the universe, the earth, and its life forms or inhabitants. The six steps paralleling with the biblical six days it took to create the world, an even older story dating to 3000 BCE is where the Sumerian gods create a divine garden for themselves and they place a lesser god in charge of it, a mortal god. Iconically, in this story, this lesser god is told not to eat of a certain plant within the garden and is later expelled from the garden and is stripped of his divinity. After his banishment, he is given eight assistants who all have special capabilities. The parallels here are obvious. As in Genesis, Cain is banished and had eight descendants, all of which had special crafts or trades. The biblical story of the birth of Moses can be traced to the Mesopotamian legend of the birth of Sargon, dating to 2371 to 2316 BCE. Sargon's mother, to save her child, hides Sargon in a woven basket and sends him off into a river. Sargon is later found by a farmer and is raised by him. Sargon grows up and becomes king. King Sargon I of Akkad was an actual king. The story of Jesus' death and subsequent resurrection as well as the alleged ascension of Mary to heaven was copied from an ancient Greek story of Heracles, 
where he and his mother were taken to Mount Olympus. Several biblical stories or proverbs, Matthew, Romans, and Exodus, can be traced to the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which dates to 1580 to 1350 BCE, with portions of this book dating even to 2600 BCE. Other stories in Deuteronomy, Ezekiel, the Book of Daniel, and Isaac, Abraham, Sarah, Jacob, all can be traced back to the 14th century BCE, where they are told in the Canaanite Bible. The tablets of these ancient writings were found in North Canaan, Syria, in 1929 by archaeologists. The biblical, the 30 wise sayings, as found in Proverbs, are strikingly similar to the Egyptian Book of Wisdom, the teachings of Amen M. Op, which date before 1000 BCE. Both the Egyptian and the Biblical versions contain an introduction followed by 30 chapters, sayings, and teachings. A coincidence? The various stories of Jesus and his miracles, healing the blind, etc., was nothing but rehashed myths and folktales. One such story took place in Alexandria, where the Olympians performed miracles for the Roman Emperor Vespasian in 69 Common Era, this taking place well over 200 years before the Bible was written. Many of the actual characters of the Bible were originally pagan characters that were copied and altered. For example, the Holy Martin, with his cloak, sword, and horse, is seen in the Norse character of Odin, with his cloak, spear, or sword, and eight-legged steed, Slipnir. St. George, the biblical hero, is seen in the Norse hero Siegfried. The Dragon Slayer, St. Peter, who guards heaven, can be seen in the Norse characters of Thor, the Thunderer, and Heimdall, who guards Asgard home of the Norse gods. Many of the so-called Christian holidays are not Christian at all, but were taken from pagan traditions. For example, the Christian Easter Resurrection Festival was taken from the pagan festival for the fertility goddess Ostara. German Ostern means Easter, Os means mouth or vagina, and Tar means generating. This goddess is equivalent to the Anglo-Saxon fertility goddess Ostera, which was celebrated during the spring equinox when fields and forests become lush, green, and full of life, i.e. they have been resurrected from the previous winter. Also, this is the time that most species have their offspring. The very symbols of Easter, the rabbit and the egg, are actually symbols that denote fertility. Rabbits. The rabbit or hare was symbolic in ancient times representing the fertility goddess for their multiple offspring and eggs. The egg was symbolic in ancient times representing female regeneration, and was traditionally painted red, symbolizing the color of womb blood for the life that is held within. This celebration of resurrection has nothing to do with Jesus. The so-called birth of Jesus, or Christmas as it is more commonly called, was taken from the pagan festival of winter solstice. Christmas replaced the early Roman celebration of Sol Invictus, which is Latin meaning the unconquered sun, or Yuletide respectively. This was a celebration for the birth of the sun. The evergreen tree was a symbol of renewed life to come with the birth of the sun. The evergreen tree is the only tree that remains green all year round. Therefore, this is symbolically appropriate for celebrating greener times to come, while in the midst of a bleak winter. The Christian holiday of All Saints Day, also known as All Hallows or All Souls, was copied from the Celtic Druidic celebration of the Harvest Festival which came the day after Samhain celebration, October 31st. It was celebrated for the beginning of the new year. Certainly a good reason to celebrate when you had a successful harvest or crop. Because the Christians wanted to destroy the old pagan celebrations, they combined and molded the pagan festivals, the Feralia and the Goddess Festival of Pomona, with the festival of Samhain, and thus coined it All Saints Day. The Christian cross, now recognized as being the symbol of Christ and Christianity, was originally a pagan symbol of the radiant sun, ascending life, just as the swastika is also representative of this, i.e. the hooked cross. Both symbols were used by the Aryan race for thousands of years prior to Christianity. And my final example, the so-called Holy Trinity, that is, the Father, Yahweh, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, is a perversion of the original pagan trinity, i.e. father, mother, and son, which are the three basic building blocks of life. The Christian version is yet another attempt to eradicate the female element from our folk. The evil myth. Yes, my friend, 
you are really suffering from a cancer-like thing. You really do harbor in yourself a deadly evil. However, it will not kill your body because it is imaginary. Carl Gustav Jung This frightful doctrine of eternal damnation is so abhorrent to every drop of my blood, so infinitely cruel, that it is impossible for me to respect either the head or heart of any human being who teaches or fears it. This doctrine necessarily subverts all ideas of justice. To inflict infinite punishment for finite beings is a proposition so monstrous that I am astonished that it ever found lodging in the brain of man. Robert Ingersoll All throughout religious history we can find the concept of evil. It is logical that our prehistoric ancestors concocted this myth to explain natural disasters such as tornadoes, hurricanes, thunderstorms, volcanoes, and other such unknown phenomena. It's probable to say that the first forms of religion sprang from this fear. A primitive people without technological advancements and instruments were unable to explain and understand the all-powerful forces of nature. Within the natural phenomenon, everything has their opposites. Where you have cold, you have hot. Where you have strong, you have weak. Where you have light, you have darkness. And where you have good, you have bad, ad infinitum. What sometimes may be considered good in one regard may not be so in another. Life is a battle, so it seems, of one extreme to another, just as the sun battles the moon for light, via V. In secular history, we can see evil and bad used as a tool to demean, as in the story of Adam and Eve, undermine and justify the Inquisitions and Crusades, the actions of man. During World War II, the American effort to demean Adolf Hitler into a monster and the great German people into evil Nazis was preposterous. It was done in the beginning to justify getting into the war, then later to justify the murderous bombing of German civilians. 250,000 murdered in Dresden and 60,000 murdered in Berlin, done for no other reason than to kill as many innocent German men, women, and children as possible. And more recently, we saw this same tactic used to justify the invasion and murder of Vicky and Sammy Weaver at Ruby Ridge. In religious history, we can see this myth of evil represented in many forms. In Aryan India, the term Aryan India is used to describe ancient India under white rule before its mongrelization and subsequent decline and eventual collapse as a ruling civilization. The religion of Aryan India was Hinduism. Its beginnings are lost in antiquity. The oldest Aryan Sanskrit writings are the Vedas, consisting of four books. The Rig Veda, Yayur Veda, Sama Veda, and the Atharva Veda, which date to about 15,000 BCE. Later writings, the Brahmans, the Upanishads, Book of Manu, Bhagavad Gita, and the epics and Purnas, for example, the Persian god of light, Ahura Mazda, is locked in battle with the god of darkness, Ahriman. They battle for world domination, with the good god, Ahura Mazda, conquering the bad god, Ahriman. The sun, light, always conquers the moon or darkness, and then establishing a new kingdom of peace, Mazdaism, Zoroastrianism, arose sometime during the 6th century BCE, as the Persians attempted to rescue Aryan India from racial pollution. In Odinism, we see the same concept in the Battle of Ragnarok, Twilight of the Gods, where the Aesir gods fight the evil forces of Fenris the Wolf and Midgard Serpent. The world is destroyed, and later a new world is created. In Christianity, the ideas are the same. Ahriman becomes the biblical Satan, and with typical earth-hating philosophies, Satan and the devil, per se, become representative of everything or anyone not subservient to its god, Yahweh. In addition, Satan becomes the master of logic and reason. In other words, if your logic and your reason tell you that the Christian Bible is full of it, then you are likely prospect for the thumbscrew and rack. Thumbscrew and rack were torture devices used by Christians against the heretics, and also representative of the mundane and material world and pleasures of the flesh. In other words, if a man or woman lusts over the opposite sex, you have sinned. I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has committed adultery. Matthew 5.28 And it is best for a man not to touch a woman. Corinthians 7.1 
and sex with women defiles men. Revelations 14, 3, and 4. And don't think about indulging in any material pursuits or acquiring any wealth in this material world. My kingdom is not of this world. John 18, 36. And do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Matthew 6, 19. In summation, it becomes a sin to simply live a normal life if you are a Christian. And as I have shown all throughout the history of this religion of love, millions of our folk have been sent to their deaths behind this Christian plague. Why I indict Christianity. Tear down the altars of other religions, destroy their sacred pillars, and cut down the symbols of their gods. Exodus 23, 23, 24, and 34, 13. Put to death any interpreter of dreams or prophet who tells you to rebel against the Lord. Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 5. If it is true that someone has worshipped other gods or the sun or moon or stars, then stone him to death. Deuteronomy 17, 2 to 7. If your family and friends persuade you to worship other gods, show them no mercy, but kill them. Be the first to stone them, and then let everyone else stone them too. Stone them to death. Deuteronomy 18, 20. I am often asked by the defenders of Christianity why I attack the Bible and their religion. I could very well quote Mr. Ingersoll here. However, I think my own words will better convey my reply to them. The Bible, as a literal guidebook to instruct, promote, and justify, has directly claimed millions of Aryan lives. It has been the sole driving force and inspiration for pious religious fanatics who have slaughtered Aryan heretics. It has laid the foundation and fueled unprecedented numbers of genocidal wars. It has persecuted and slaughtered the most intelligent and gifted of our folk. It has undermined Nordic superiority. It has attacked, vilified, and utterly destroyed any notion of independent thought and has deceived our folk into denying and disrespecting nature and even denying to be ashamed of our own very nature. It has been the battle cry that slaughtered the unborn, infants, young children, and the elderly of our folk. It has founded the 800-year reign of the Dark Ages and the 600-year reign of the Inquisitions. It has designed and constructed the death dungeons and scaffolds where Aryans have been tortured and slaughtered. It has designed, constructed, and utilized the torturing devices that were forcefully administered on our folk. It has lit the blazing flames that burned alive Aryan men and women. It has utilized the rusty chains that bound our folk to planks. It has fashioned the knives, spikes, and needles, which pulverized and bloodied the soft, delicate bodies of Aryan women. It has ridiculed and victimized and fanatically destroyed every aspect of good Aryan life. It has defaced, torn down, and burnt all of our ancient pagan landmarkers, temples, memorial sites, and has destroyed and perverted Nordic customs, traditions, and symbols. And finally, your Bible says that you must kill me and the people close to me because we choose to be pagans. Now, let me ask you, how can you defend this Christian Bible? K. Butcher, December 1998